So I'm going to tell you a story that back in November of 1991, I was a fall of my senior year of college. It was a cold, dreary day. And at that time, I was not quite sure what I was going to do after graduating from college. I had thought about going to law school and had even done some initial work of getting ready to take the test for the law school uh, to get into law school. But I, uh, after having a summer of an internship of working in an actual law office, I was not so sure if that career was for me. And I'm smiling at Russ. Because <laughs> it is a unique work. But this one particular day, early in October, early October, I'm looking at the paper. And in this paper, I see an advertisement for a 1992 Honda Prelude. Brand new car. And within a few seconds of seeing that advertisement, I want it. Now, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do after college, but now I was pretty sure that I wanted to get a job that enabled me to buy this 1992 Honda Prelude when I graduated. And so in my job search, that's what I made sure I could do. I interviewed four and I got a job that would enable me to buy a new car. Now it turned out it was not that 1992 Honda Prelude. It turned out to be a 1992 Nissan Sentra. But it was new and it was red. And it was beautiful. But there was a problem, and the problem was that this job that I got, that I thought was going to enable me to buy this new car, was not a job that I enjoyed, and it was not a job for me. So when I decided to leave that job that had enabled me to get that new car, I had to get another job that enabled me to keep the car. <laughs> And while I interviewed for and got another job, a little bit better suited for me, it took me to faraway exotic places, like Grand Island, Nebraska. Anybody ever been to Grand Island, Nebraska? Yeah, keep on driving. <laughs> took me to Rapid City, South Dakota. Pretty scenic place, but not quite where I dreamed to be. And that little red car came with me. And while this was a better job, and I learned a lot with it, it still was not my calling. So that little red car now took us, Pastor Julie and I, to Spearfish, South Dakota, to then Sioux Falls, South Dakota, as we traversed school and work. It eventually took us to Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. So after all these journeys and a few years in school, this car was not so new anymore. Hundreds of thousands of miles, scratches and dents and scuffs and spills on the interior and things that happen to new cars over time. And even one harrowing afternoon of being broken down and stranded right in the middle where Interstate 94 and Interstate 35W meet, just south of downtown Minneapolis. Many of us have been there in that interchange of overpasses in the middle of this awful place to have a car break down before the days of cell phones. So getting help was a bit of an interesting experience. Eventually that car wore out. It was traded in for another car, a very used car this time. Sometimes I wonder about that little 1992 red Nissan Sentra. I wonder how different would the, would the first few years of my post-college life had been, possibly, if I was less consumed about getting a new car right after graduation. Would I have considered some other job opportunities that weren't required, where the income wasn't required to support a new car? Would my journey to Luther Seminary had been any quicker or easier without those jobs along the way that were required to support the purchase of a new car? I don't know. That's probably thinking too hard about it. 
Or sometimes I wonder if I had never seen that advertisement in that paper that morning for that 1992 Honda Prelude, would I have ended up going to law school? Maybe by this time I'd have garages full of new cars. That's too much to put on that little red car. Who knows? But this I do know. I cannot blame any struggles that I had in my vocational search and calling on that little red car. I was struggling to find a calling in my life, as all of us do early on. But this one thing I do know, it was that little red car that enabled me to travel from Grand Island, Nebraska, up to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and here to Wisconsin, when Julie and I were dating. It was that little red car that took us away from the pressures and strain of seminary studies to the freedom of the North Shore of Lake Superior, where we'd like to go camping during those days. Or when we needed to go back to our hometowns of Seneca, Wisconsin, and Spring County, South Dakota, when we needed to be at the kitchen tables of our parents. It was that car that took us to all those places. It was that car that took us from our honeymoon to the brink of parenthood, and it was only traded in for another car because Kaya was on the way, soon to be born, and we needed a car that had some type of resemblance of a back seat in which she was to ride. No, the trouble with the treasure of that car was not that I had no business of buying it when I did, when I, in actuality I could not afford it, even though that's true. No, the trouble of the treasure of that car was not that maybe it forced me to, look, to not have the freedom to look at some jobs because I needed a job that could earn enough to afford a new car. That was only slightly true. And the trouble of the treasure of that car wasn't even that when we traded it in, we got very little for it because of all the miles driven and all the wear and tear upon it. For that's the truth of all cars and most things that we buy. No, the trouble of the treasure of that car really has nothing to do with the car itself, but rather that I, we, I am a human being. And I have the power to acquire treasure cars or whatever other material item we want. And because we are human beings, we always fear that there will not be enough. Or in a matter of cars, maybe we fear that someone else will have a car exactly like ours. Remember Pharaoh, the, the ruler of ancient Egypt? Pharaoh was afraid that there weren't enough good things to go around, and so he must try to have them all. And because he is fearful and because he has great power, he, all, he is ruthless. So Pharaoh hires Joseph. Yes, the Joseph that we know, the son of Jacob, the Joseph who got the, the multicolored coat as a gift from his father and whose brothers were jealous and so they sold him into slavery, and they told his father that he was killed by a wild animal. That Joseph. He made his way to Egypt and had some amazing skills, and so Pharaoh hires Joseph to manage this monopoly of wealth in the country. And when the crops fail and the peasants would run out of food, they came to Joseph. And on behalf of Pharaoh, Joseph would say, what is your collateral? And they would give up their land for the food. And then the next year of the famine, they would come back and they would give up their cattle or their livestock or other possessions. And by the third year of the famine, they had had no collateral other than themselves. And so they gave up themselves and their freedom for food. And that's how the children of Israel became slaves, through an economic transaction. And in some ways, I feel that we are maybe capable of doing the same. Maybe in our worries about having enough or worries about keeping up with the material demands of our lives. 
Maybe we fear there won't be enough for us. And so we collateral ourselves. And we become slaves to these material things or the material demands. I think that's true for us whether we have a million dollars or whether our combined bank account totals are $10.37. I think the pressures and the forces at work are the same. And it is in this collateralization of our lives that I wonder if the real trouble is tr with treasure is not whether or not we can afford something, whether or not we should get something new. But the trouble of treasure is that it leads us away from doing that, I think, which we are truly called to do in life. It leads us away from the moment of discovering where our gifts and our skills meet, and our passions and desires are, and where those two things meet in the needs and responsibilities of living with one another. The trouble of treasure is that I think too many times we give in to the demands, material demands of life. And sometimes it keeps us away from where we truly are meant to be. But the amazing thing about Christ, even in this parable that he shares with us and challenges us in our hearts, is that he tells us that a life in Christ frees us from this trouble of treasure. It's not so much that we won't still want stuff, or that we won't make too many decisions based on what we want rather than what we need. But with Christ entering our life, he makes it possible for us to let go of that trouble to look to others first. Because when the end of our life comes, our value in that life does not depend on our treasure that we acquired. It depends rather on the treasure that Christ found in us and how Christ freed us to discover it. So I'm going to ask you to go home and take a look at your stuff. Both the stuff you can see in your house and in your shelves and in your boxes and all those things around you. But also, in equal measure, the stuff that is upon your heart. And the demands that we feel about living with all these things we need to support in our life. And what is all of that stuff and the demands of acquiring it keeping you from discovering about the treasure that is within you and your true calling in life? Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't have this figured out either. <laughs> By no means. I still struggle with the balance of desiring treasure and discovering God's call in my life and all of those, all of those struggles. But I do know this. That God's love for me is not dependent on the treasure I accumulate or create or the image I create around myself. But rather, God's love for me is based upon the treasure that is already there and has been there long before that 1992 Nissan Sentra came into my life. Now, there is still a mystery to where the next car or the next adventure in my life will lead me. But I know that I look forward to that journey and that whether I am traveling with treasure that requires just one bag or a treasure that requires U-Hauls upon U-Hauls. That Christ has freed me from the burden of that treasure. And it's that freedom, that freedom in which we walk with each other. May you walk with Christ in that time. May he walk with you. And for that freedom we say thanks be to God. Amen. We sing together day by day. It's number 790. Please remain seated as we sing.